You know, I have to tell you, as I watch the news unfold, as I watch our culture unfold, more importantly, everything the left does, tries to do, says they're going to do, causes the opposite effect of what they think they're going to do. They call for diversity and they end up with segregation. They call for strong feminist win women and women wind up, the feminist women wind up, these quivering little, uh, these quivering little weaklings complaining about every little thing. And they say, oh, women should be appreciated for their minds and they wear up wind up wearing vagina hats where their brains are supposed to be. And of course, they call for equality and they go for socialism, which creates this powerful elite and puts everybody else in poverty. Is not, nothing is more divisive and unequal than socialism. And the reason, the reason for this is, in their care for the underdog, which I support, I believe in looking out for the underdog, but in their care for the underdog, instead of trying to lift up the underdog, they're always trying to pull down the stronger person. And that is a recipe for disaster, right? So if, thing, they, if things are tilted toward whites, instead of saying, oh, we're going to lift up blacks, what they say is we're going to tear down whites. We're going to bar the whites from this and we're going to tell them they can't do this. We're going to cut down on the number of whites. What do you do? You just reinstitutionalize racism and eventually whites are going to say, oh, well, if racism is OK, I'm in. I'll be in favor of whites then. And if men are strong and they feel that women are not as strong, they browbeat men into weakness instead of teaching women to be women and have strength as women. They browbeat men into weakness. And what's the result? Does that make men and women more equal? No, it means that only bad people, only men who can't be browbeaten are strong and women are abused even more, as we've been seeing in the Me Too movement, so much of which is concentrated in the left. And of course, the big one, if, guy, if there's a guy and he's rich, they say, I'm going to take his money away and give it to the poor instead of teaching the poor man how to make money, how to become uh, a richer guy and, and raise him up. They take money away from the rich guy. What happens then? The rich guy closes his business. The poor guy has nowhere to get a job. And so, you know, all of this, all of this is what it goes into the divided state of the country, the way this country is now. We're just not talking to each other. We're two countries completely at odds. And they think, they think, oh, well, you know, we've monopolized the academy. We won't let in conservatives to teach. They won't even let Ben in to talk half the time. They, they've monopolized the academy. They have completely monopolized the news media. The news media is absurd. And this is going to somehow force us all together, Hollywood, all the comedians, all of this stuff. This is somehow going to force us together to all become leftists. No, instead, it makes us hate one another. There's an exclusive poll out, poll out that the Washington Examiner uh, got an exclusive on. Paul Bedard was writing the article there. He says nearly three quarters of the country believes that the media is dividing Americans along political, racial, and gender lines. This is a stunning condemn condemnation of the press in a new national survey from Zogby Analytics Poll. It said that the media bias is sparking hate and misunderstanding. And while Americans also blame President Trump for dividing voters, the survey analysis said the media is worse. Those sur surveyed felt the mainstream media spreads hate and misunderstanding and also felt that President Trump is responsible for the spread of hate and misunderstanding. But more voters overall and in more subgroups blame the media slightly more. And you can see this. You can see this every day, especially as the way they are covering. I mean, it is absurd the way they are covering this recount in Florida and they hammer any Republican who says, oh, there's fraud. I mean, there's obviously in Broward County, there's obviously incompetence, at least, at least incompetence. And, you know, they, they're reporting, they're reporting that the woman, this, uh, what's her name, Brenda Skypes or Brenda Sykes, I can't remember what her name is. They're reporting that she is actually uh, not, you know, she can't, she couldn't possibly be uh, unfair to, um, to, Republicans. She is a Republican. Here's Andrea Mitchell reporting this. This is cut seven. And we should also point out that Brenda Snipes in Broward County is a Republican appointed by former governor, then Governor Jeb Bush. So she was put in by a Republican governor after the mess that oh, we all remember from two, 2000. And she's hardly a Democratic uh, official or someone doing the bidding of the Democratic candidates there. Hank, fake news. It's fake news. She's a Democrat. She's a Democrat partisan, clearly a partisan. Jeb Bush himself, who appointed her after the, you know, mess up on the uh, Bush Gore campaign when they had to do th that recount, he appointed her to say, oh, we're going to be all bipartisan here. Even he has called for her firing. She has messed up so badly. So anytime Trump says, oh, there's there's a problem here, they say, well, he's speaking without proof. But when the other side says something, 
when the Democrats say something, Andrew Gillum, for instance, well, let play what Andrew Gillum said about this election. He's the guy who lost the governor's race. And so the task at our hand right now is to make sure that we show up and we show out in this process and let these folks know that we are not going to be ignored. We're not going to be hushed. We're not going to be set to the side. We're not going to be told that we don't have a seat at the table. We're going to pull up our own folding chair if we got to. We'll bring our own table if we must. But we're going to do our job to make sure that this process works for all of us. Unbelievable. So he's so when we say there might be fraud, there's no proof. It's conspiracy theory. We're undermining America's faith in our democratic institutions. But when he says it, suddenly it's a civil rights campaign. It's because he's being hushed. Who's hushing him? Where's the evidence that anybody's hushing him? If he's being hushed, how come we're hearing him from him? It's utterly ridiculous. And this is what divides us. This is what causes people to have conspiracy theories when they can't trust the information they're getting. This, of course, is not it's not just the news media. It is also social media. And here is a story that is unbelievable, but it tells you this is how the, the left, everything they, does, they do turns out the opposite. They think they're going to silence hate speech, but they just spread the hate by demonizing the other side. There's this guy, Palmer Lucky. He's the guy who found, founded Oculus. Those are those things you wear that give you three-dimensional games and all this stuff. And Oculus was acquired by Facebook in 2014. And last year, Facebook fired Palmer Lucky, and they say it had nothing to do with the $10,000 donation he made to a pro-Trump group. But Mark Zucker Zuckerberg, obviously the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, hatched a plan that was supposed to rehabilitate him because he needed to be rehabilitated for the evil of voting for Trump. So he told Lucky, what you got to do is you got to say you're a libertarian because you can get away with being a libertarian in, in uh, Silicon Valley, not a conservative, but a libertarian you can get away with. So he said, you can go out and say you're voting for Gary. The problem was, the problem was that Mr. Lucky read The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump when he was 13, and that's why he became an entrepreneur. So ultimately, they couldn't rehabilitate the guy, and they fire him. They fire him. And this, of course, you know, comes on the heels of, uh, of Google firing James Damore for saying men and women are different, and that may have, be the reason they have different... Uh, you know, they show up for tech jobs in a different way, and there are fewer women in tech. Facebook, see, here's the thing. Facebook is having a bad year, and it, according to the Wall Street Journal, it's taking a toll on employee morale, with several key measures of internal sentiment taking a sharp turn for the worse over the past year. The stock price is plunging. Uh, there's leadership turmoil, critical media coverage, and just over half of employees said they were optimistic about Facebook's future. Now, this is like... This is amazing because the whole thing about Silicon Valley is you're supposed to feel that your company is changing the world. It's not just a communication tool. It's actually going to change the entire world. So now Facebook is thinking, are we the baddies? Are we the bad guys? You know, maybe so, maybe so. When you silence people, when you silence people, and call them call it hate speech and dis decree that anything that disagrees with you is hate speech you don't end hate you spread hate it's always the opposite of what they expect you know cat Timp, I, I, this story really got me because we all know these people are getting harassed and attacked anybody who's a conservative is getting harassed and attacked in restaurants and things but cat Timp, if you've ever met her she's just this tiny little thing and she's a kind of a cute funny presence on the greg gutfeld show and she walks into a bar and she told this story about what happened to her. Yeah, over the weekend, I was at a bar and a girl started, she realized I worked at Fox News, started screaming at me, telling me to get out. I tried to move to a different area of the bar. She kept screaming at me, telling me to get out. I kept trying to say, like, what did you, what did I say that you had a problem with? Or maybe I thought it was one of my views that was so offensive. She said, it doesn't matter. I don't think she knew a single thing that I ever said on TV. She just knew where I worked. And that was enough for me to be run out of the bar. Because if you're Fox News, I mean, who has demonized Fox News? Who has gone out of their way to make Fox News just a byword for something is wrong? They don't even have to argue with it if it's on Fox News. They just roll their eyes and say, oh, well, it's Fox News. It's Fox News. I mean, that's how they one of the ways they have silenced conservative voices is just by demonizing anybody who dares to take that tack. So now you get this girl going in. I mean, she's she weighs 
you know, she's five foot nothing. You get this girl going into a bar. She's being chased out of bars. And what kind of mindset, how, how toxic does your mind have to be before you do that? So by silencing hate speech, they're in fact spreading hate. And this is the thing. It's always the opposite of what they want. And, you know, Google's got a problem because now these guys are in their uh, face. They've got these uh, politicized workers who are trying to work their way up. Uh, Holman Jenkins writes about this in the Wall Street Journal. He says, Google protests within the organization have been led by a group calling itself the Tech Workers Coalition, whose avowed purposes are ideological rather than strictly work-related. They want politics to be in control of business. That includes deciding which products and services will be developed. And the goal is power. A particular and immediate menace to Google's top leadership is a sexual neo-Puritaner Puritanism in the workplace that appears to be adopted mainly as a broom to sweep middle-aged white men out of the company. In other words, if you're a middle-aged white man, you are going to be charged with sexual malpractice and sexual malfeasance, and you're swept out of the country, the company. And the minute you're gone, the minute the white men are gone, that that charge is not, that that charge is not going to happen. This is the way, this is what happens. You know, it's like you think, you think you're going to bring everybody together by silencing the opposition, but in fact, you just make the opposition worse. And in fact, you start to eat each other. Same thing applies to sex. And this is like, if you see, this is in the Atlantic. There is a, I think it's the cover article on the Atlantic that people have stopped having sex. And this is, I mean, there's a sex drought going on, a sex recession. And, and this is, this is an amazing thing, right? Because if, if you remember the times that I grew up in, suddenly we were going to have sexual paradise. All the rules were gone. All we were going to do is have sex. We weren't even going to have to think. We weren't even going to have to have relationships. We're just going to hook up. And now they, we have the technologies to hook up and everything is, nothing is wrong. It doesn't matter what kind of sex you have. You declare you're a man, you're a man. You declare you're a woman, you're a woman. Whatever you want to do, it's all fine. You would think people would be having sex until they couldn't think straight. Instead, it stops. And she writes in The New Yorker, this is Kate Julian. She writes, many experts attribute the sex decline to a decline in couplehood among young people. Why? Because when people are couples, they have sex more. Married people have sex more than unmarried people. She says, for a quarter century, fewer people have been marrying and those who do have been marrying later. And at first, many observers figured the decline in marriage would be matched by an increase in just cohabitating, but, they, but it wasn't. There wasn't enough to do it. People have stopped having relationships. She says, over the course of many conversations with sex researchers, psychologists, economists, sociologists, therapists, sex educators, and young adults, I heard many other theories about what I have come to think of as the sex recession. Now, listen carefully and see if you can hear the missing word here. See if you can hear the missing word. Here's why experts told her they weren't having sex. I was told it might be a consequence of the hookup culture, of crushing economic pressures, of surging anxiety rates, of psycho psychological frailty, of widespread antidepressant use, of streaming television, of environmental estrogens leaked by plastics, of dropping testosterone levels, of digital porn, of the vibrator's golden age, of dating apps, of option paralysis, of helicopter parents, of careerism, of smartphones, of the new cycle of information overload generally, of sleep deprivation, of obesity. Think, what's the missing word? The missing word is feminism. The missing word is feminism. Feminism, which is a synonym for good on the left, good for women, cannot be to blame for anything. Couldn't be to blame for p kids getting too fat because their moms aren't home to give them the love they need. Couldn't be to blame for that. Couldn't be to blame for the fact that people don't want to have sex. You know, why do people have sex? You know, the thing is, we've been sold this idea, especially about men, especially about men, that men are just a peg looking for a hole. You know, that's all a man is. A man, all, all we want is to have sex all the time. That's, you know, that's all the only thing on a man's mind. I know the only thing on a man's mind. It's been going on for a long time, that attitude about men. Men want to have sex with women. And if women aren't women, what's the point? You know, having sex with women is a costly proposition. You know, they want you to stay around. They, you know, the old joke that you don't pay a prostitute to have sex with you, you pay her to leave. Well, you know, when you have sex with women, they want you to stay around. You want, they want you to help raise their children. They want you to help, you know, be, be a, an emotional support to them. Hey, it's great if you like women and if women are women. But if women are told uh, that they're supposed to hate men, if they're told they're not supposed to be women, that they're not supposed to be feminine, it starts to be a costly proposition. Everything they do, everything they do winds up the opposite of what it's supposed to do. So we were supposed to be sexually free. Feminine, feminism was supposed to make women strong. Instead, all they've done is drive us apart.
All they do is drive us apart. And if you can drive men and women apart, you're really working overtime. You're really getting it done.